26th, and I'm Council Chair Charlie Zoe. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, because of COVID-19, we're continuing to conduct our meetings uh, virtually under Minnesota statutes, section 13D.021, and it gives us their authorization authority to do so. And I invite the public who might be uh, tuning in through our website and YouTube channel that we would certainly welcome comments or questions to uh, our email at public.info at metc.state.mn.us. And we will certainly uh, take note of them and respond. Uh, Given this is a virtual nature, we will have a roll call for each business item. And to establish a quorum, Liz, you may call the roll. Barber? Here. Chambliss? Here. Cummings? Here. Ferguson? Here. Fredson? Here. Gonzalez? Present. Johnson? Here. Lee? Lee? Lilligren? Here. Lindstrom? Here. Musse? Here. Sterner? Sterner? Vento? Here. Wolf? Here. Zurin? Zurin? And Chair Zully. I'm here. We have a quorum. I see Council Member Sterner is here, but maybe having some connection uh, issues. Yep, I think uh, at least on the voice now, so thank you, Chair. Oh, there you go. Great. Um, on to the agenda. We don't need a roll call but unless there is a, an amendment or an objection. I will assume the agenda that was sent out in advance and posted is approved, which brings us to the minutes from our meeting January 12th, 2022. Is there a motion to approve the January 12th? This is a stern, I'd make a motion to approve it. Uh, the Thank you. Is there a second? Second by Gonzalez. Thank you, Council Member Gonzalez. Uh, any discussion? Directions. All right. Hearing none, Liz, please call the roll. Barber? Aye. Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lee? Aye. Lilligren? Aye. Lindstrom? Aye. Musse? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Abstain? Zurin? Chair uh, I'll abstain as well because I wasn't at the meeting. But the minutes are approved. We're now at the point of the agenda where we have uh, opportunity for public comment, um, but no uh, one has pre-registered to speak today. Uh, just as a reminder, if you wish to offer a comment at a virtual meeting, please pre-register by emailing public.info at metc.state.mn.us. Uh, we can, you can also very welcome to send any comments to us by email at that uh, same address. Thank you. So first up is an information item. Uh, I have really been looking forward to getting a report from Brian Rex at the Metropolitan Airport Commission. Brian serves as the executive director and CEO of the MAC. And as we all know, he is responsible for the administration management of not only the St. Paul Minneapolis International Airport, but the MAX-6 uh, reliever uh, airports. 
Uh, and before Brian begins, I just want to note uh, per uh, state statute that the council actually reviews elements uh, of the max capital improvement program. And that action is before the council later on the agenda. But first, Brian is going to present a kind of a separate information item, uh, which might incorporate some of that uh, capital uh, program, but more importantly, just a general overview. So that is in part just a coincidence I wanted to note. But Brian, welcome to the council, and it's uh, good to see you, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Chair Zelli. Good to see you as well, and, and counselors, good to see all of you. I think Russ was going to pull my presentation up, if I'm not mistaken, and hopefully that will work. But I, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to join you again uh, this year. I think for the second time in a row, uh, virtual, we'll look forward to getting back together, hopefully, in the not too distant future. I also want to recognize um, Councillor uh, Ferguson, who's been our liaison to the Airports Commission for a number of years now and appreciate all of the, the support and the connection that he provides uh, to all of you. I want to thank uh, your staff. Uh, I know uh, Bridget from my staff works hand in hand and I think it's a, a great collaborative relationship. So Russ, if you want to go ahead and and push it uh, forward. Uh, you can go to the next one as well. Just a just a recap of our uh, airports commission. Uh, whoops. Well, excuse me. First, I'll start with uh, as many of you probably uh, know. Or go ahead and go back to that one. We are a seven airport system, obviously with uh, Minneapolis St. Paul being uh, the the major hub airport. St. Paul downtown being uh, one of uh, six relievers. And then you can see Lake Elmo, Anoka County, Crystal, Flying Cloud, and, and Air Lake. We are, I, th I believe, the largest airport system operated by a commission or authority in the country. And so um, it keeps us, uh, keeps us busy. The system works extremely well and is designed really to focus Minneapolis on the uh, scheduled air carrier and cargo traffic and filter the corporate as much of the corporate and the general aviation traffic out to that reliever system. Works very well, uh, certainly was demonstrated uh, when we hosted the Super Bowl and were able to accommodate all of those corporate uh, aircraft that descended upon our uh, region. You can go to the next slide, Russ, if, if you'd like. A little bit about our commission. It is chaired by Rick King. Rick does a fantastic job for us. Um, 15 total commissioners. Uh, representing different districts. The newest commissioners we have this year are uh, Commissioner Lawrence and Commissioner Baylor, and uh, great appointees uh, with a wealth of ex experience. Uh, go ahead, uh, Russ. The commission has, uh, I, I manage about 690 employees. I will preface that by telling you currently we've, we have about 630 employees. Now, we were fortunate we did not have to lay off anyone during COVID, and I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, the way we operated during COVID is we just did not fill open positions, and our staff realized that is what we needed to do to get through. Uh, I, I should caveat that by saying, unless they were absolutely mission critical. In the past six months, we have gotten back into hiring positions to help our staff out that, that frankly, have been very stressed uh, through, this, uh, through this time doing much more uh, for um, for less. Uh, we operate much like a city with the exception we do not take in taxpayer dollars, general taxpayer dollars. We operate the airport as a as a business, uh, really funded by rents and fees. And, um, you, you know, with the premise that if, if you use the airport, you help pay for it. If you do business on the airport, we receive a, a concession off of that. And it works. It works extremely, extremely well. Uh, next slide, Russ. And then you can go, go ahead and move on to a little bit about the impacts of the pandemic. Obviously, our aviation industry has been hit very hard, uh, you know, really about $40 billion in losses between March of 2020 and, and March of 2022. When we bring that closer to the home, to the MAC, we lost uh, $218 million from our projected revenue in 2020. Uh, our projected revenue was about $406 million uh, you know, back in 2019. So that's, we were expecting to actually increase a little bit uh, beyond that in 2020. Uh, lost another 126 million in 2021. And we're projecting to be about 50 million below that roughly 400 million uh, mark in 2019. 
as a result, we've had to uh, make some adjustments, and the most significant adjustment is really deferring about 300 million in capital investment projects in uh, when you combine 2021 that second 21 should actually say 22 so or excuse me in 20 uh, 20 and 21 uh, we did we were fortunate we did receive uh, some uh, relief thank uh, thank goodness uh, you know airports and airlines got in early and we received about 158 million uh, in uh, in cares act funds uh, to help us, our MAC reliever airports also received some money, about 678,000 distributed between the six of them. Also with the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, the most, the, the more recent uh, plan, uh, we are going to receive about 118 million. Uh, also, the, the nice part of that is our, some of our stakeholders, our concessionaires uh, have the ability to, to acquire about 16.4 million in relief uh, for that uh, for that act, and then you can see our reliever airports uh, uh, received about another hundred or six hundred thousand uh, dollars. I also want to ex express uh, we passed on over a hundred million dollars of relief to our airlines and deferred rents and, and fees, and also our concessions, including um, you know food and beverage retail concessionaires and also uh, rental car uh, companies. That that totaled about thirty five million. And our, you know, our belief there was that we we all need to survive this. We all need to come out of this, and um, and that was a, a a very good gesture on behalf of the commission. Uh, go ahead to the next one, Russ. A little bit about uh, passenger numbers and, and really what it uh, what it looks like. You can see um, in 2020 the the you know yellowish uh, line there. Really, when we when we um, dropped into COVID in April of 2020, we only had 5% of, of our uh, passengers uh, flying out of here, which certainly was expected. That number slowly or gradually um, uh, grew throughout the year, but it, it still, when you look at it, was pretty flat. And then you compare uh, 2021, where we started the year off about 60% below 2019, and we ended the year off about 19% below 2019 uh, level. So it's it's been a gradual climb back. Obviously, as we all know, it's it's uh, dictated by the uh, the variants that have um, that have appeared here throughout this uh, situation. I just received actually just a few minutes ago our total numbers for 2021. Uh, so you're the first to hear that. My my PR people are going to be upset if. Uh, if uh, someone else hears it first, but it's it's at about 25, just over 25 million passengers, which puts us about 36 percent below 2019 when we had uh, almost 40 million passengers, 39 and a half million passengers to be exact, and that was a record year back in 2019. Uh, next slide, Russ. Uh, this gives you. Uh, really a sense of our air service recovery. You can see again, the, the blue line when we dropped into COVID, uh, we had 225 uh, nonstop routes uh, amongst all the airlines that dropped to a low of 91 and has gradually climbed back to 195 active routes. 166 of those are domestic routes, 29 of those are international routes, and then uh, the 32 below that are still suspended uh, routes that uh, we uh, are still trying to get back. 23 of those are domestic, uh, nine, are, nine are international. I think the good, news, the, the good news that we've heard from Delta from an international perspective is that they have indicated they are going to bring back all of those international routes. It, it's just a matter of time, and, and certainly the Asia-Pacific routes are the ones that will be lagging uh, the, the most. Uh, the other good news is that we've We've been able to add 27 new destinations this year. A lot of that has been uh, Sun Country growth, frankly, in the things that Sun Country is is doing. So we do have some good uh, some good news to share. Next slide, Russ. This gives you a sense of our annual uh, or our average daily departures um, by by month, and. Um, again, you can see it when it dropped into COVID. We were down to 123. Uh, daily, on average, daily operations, and that number should have been up in the 500 to 550 uh, range. 
Uh, the dotted line shows uh, where February is projected, so we're inching closer to that, and, and it's nice to see in March we'll get up to about 410, um, 410 operations a, a, a day. So we're we're getting there, but it's uh, it's a it's a slow it's a slow recovery. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, a little bit of a sense of our reliever uh, airport operations. A actually, relievers have recovered pretty well, which I, I think, and when you look at St. Paul downtown's numbers, 29.8%, what that tells us is that a lot of that corporate traffic has come back. And so a very good sign. And, and, and again, when you look at, at our reliever airport operations across the board, they're all up with the exception of, of Crystal Airport. But Again, good sign for general aviation that uh, those numbers are, are coming back. Go ahead and move on to the next slide, and you can go, you can go to the next one. Uh, when we when we dropped into COVID, go back one, uh, Russ. You know, one of the things we we take very seriously the um, you know a program that we have uh, termed travel confidently. We wanted to ensure that as an airport, we were doing everything we could. To bring people back, or those people that needed to fly could be confident that that they would be safe traveling through the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. So we we engaged these six areas and focused on them, and, and frankly, it's been very uh, very successful. And that uh, we continue to focus on these areas as we move forward. Next slide, uh, Russ. Um, you know, masks. We all know about masks. Uh, uh, the news on masks is that. Um, the federal government, uh, the CDC and TSA continue to require masks right now through March of 2022. Uh, we'll see if that, uh, that gets extended when we get closer. Uh, the other thing that we've done is uh, we have gone through a couple of different accreditation programs to ensure that our airport is best in class. And uh, the two programs, are, one is a global, uh, the global uh, um, uh, a global program called the GBAC Star Program, uh, and the other one is the Airports Council International Airport Health Accreditation uh, Program. And it's really about ensuring that all of our tactics uh, are at the highest standards and we're doing all we can to, uh, again, reduce the spread of COVID and, again, ensure that people are confident when they travel through our airports. These are not just nameplate certifications they are a very detailed certification uh, application process that we have to go through uh, we first did it in 2020 and then uh, we became recertified just recently or actually in 2021 and and we'll continue to uh, work actually we just got recertified for this year as well uh, next slide russ as far as testing and vaccines we partnered early with the minnesota department of health uh, for a saliva testing site at MSP. That site has been extremely busy, as you can imagine, over the, over the past uh, month and a half, it, it actually to a point where we had to um, go back to appointments only because there was so much congestion coming into it and also um, the, the, the people waiting. It, it actually was blocking some of our security checkpoint areas. So. Uh, we went back to appointments only. We also have a rapid test site that you can get tested if you need immediate results. Um, and then we have vaccination sites both at Terminal 1 and, and Terminal 2. I also want to mention um, we've also had a real ID uh, uh, site uh, activated at the airport for about two and a half years now as the, the real ID um, uh, situation or the requirement has been pushed back, but um, we want to do all we can. And I'll tell you, if, if you're looking to get a real ID, there's no better place to do it than out at the airport. It's pre-security. You can walk up. In, in fact, uh, my wife went through it the other day. She was in and out in, I bet, uh, 10 or 15 minutes. So no appointments needed. So that's a good one. Next slide, uh, next slide uh, Russ. I'm going to move into capital improvements a little bit here. Uh, you know, again, I mentioned we pushed about $300 million back over the past two years. Our budget for 2022 is about $267 million. Typically, we've been up in the range anywhere from $300 to $500 million in, in capital improvements. But, but again, um, we've had to push some back just because the revenues are not coming in like they, they used to. You can see the majority of projects are under our MSP long-term 
Uh, comp plan projects, about 30% of those. We've got about 24% of the projects are MSP end of life replacement projects. And then, you know, 18% with um, uh, maintenance facility upgrades and ongoing maintenance at, at 15%. It is a tremendous asset to continue to maintain. And obviously the current concern is when you push $300 million back, uh, you can't keep doing that because you're really going to get behind if um, if uh, you think don't take uh, measures to uh, pick it up. Next slide. One of the things that has helped recently is the is um, the bipartisan infrastructure deal, uh, and uh, basically what that has done for airports is infused about 20 billion uh, for airports over five years. Uh, when you look at um, uh, what we uh, receive from that uh, from that formula, we will receive about 37 and a half million over the next two years, and then the following years will be based on the number of emplanements or passengers that roll through our facility. We are estimating that we'll receive about 180 to 190 million dollars. So that will help offset that 300 million, but it goes it it comes nowhere near to still where the where the shortfall uh, is. Uh, there was also a program in there for general aviation airports, so our, our MAC uh, relievers will get about 3.1 million out of that uh, program that will be distributed based on projects. Uh, there's also a, a program for terminal development. It's about a billion dollars a year. Now, um, large hub airports only qualify for about 55% of that billion dollars, but uh, we can compete uh, to replace aging infrastructure, increase ADA compliance, and, and really improve energy efficiency in those uh, in those facilities. So we will be aggressive in, in going after uh, any of those funds that we can for our terminal projects. I, I want to highlight just a, a, a few uh, projects that we have going on out there. This, this first one is a new aircraft rescue and firefighting facility. Uh, along with a safety and security center. Now what this does, the, the firefighting facility replaces the very first fire station that was on, built on the airport back in, oh boy, the, the 60s. Uh, it, it is desperately in need of, of replacement. And then we move into um, really combining all of our safety and security functions into one centralized facility to really support our emergency operations our police department, air site operations. Uh, it, it's going to be a state-of-the-art facility that is going to service, uh, service very well as we work through, you know, incidents and, and you know, anything else that possibly could happen on this site. Another project, if you want to move, uh, Russ, is our, you know, one I'm sure if you've been to the airport, you can go, go back one that you've become uh, unfortunately familiar with, and that is uh, what we call our operational improvements program. Uh, this is the, the project where we are adding 15 feet to the front of Terminal 1 and um, really remodeling and enhancing our ticketing areas, our baggage claim areas, and all of our vertical circulation areas. And that project is turning out ex uh, very nice uh, right now. It, it couldn't be timed any better. We needed the additional space, not only to support passengers, but to support social distancing. And um, uh, you'll continue to see those improvements uh, move forward. The, the good news is most of the areas that have been a disruption to passenger flow are, we're getting there. Um, we still have some baggage uh, carousel areas in the lower level to do, but the baggage carousels are much larger. Uh, we've gone to all LED lighting in that area. We've we put terrazzo in, in the floor, we've raised the ceiling. So it's a much nicer experience really from curb to gate than it, than it used to. We're very proud of this, this uh, project and it really is, a, I think, a good example of how the airport has been able to be uh, transformed to, to stay modern. And then the next project I wanna just give you a little bit of a sense of is uh, a project that's going on down on the end of Concourse G between gates 17 and 22. And uh, actually, what we're expanding the concourse in that area, we've added a large rotunda, and then we've added space above, uh, which you can kind of see on the right side there. That is going to be a new Delta Sky Club. Uh, there's two Delta Sky Clubs currently, one on Concourse C and one on kind of between G and F in the main mall area. 
those sky clubs have become extremely busy and congested. And, and so we're very happy that Delta has decided to build another sky club. The way this works is the airports commission puts the shell up and then Delta comes in and finishes uh, the sky club up. It's going to have wonderful views of the airfield and it's actually going to have an outside deck, uh, obviously not used for days like today, but during, uh, during uh, good weather conditions where people will be able to, to actually go outside and, um, and spend time outside. So we're, we're very happy about that. It's gonna have new restrooms, new concessions and be a, a fantastic addition to the facility. Uh, next slide, Russ. <clears throat> the other thing that we have um, picked up again uh, is our long-term planning effort at MSP. It was suspended due to COVID um, and so uh, we are moving forward with that. This is really, you know, the program that uh, you will uh, approve, hopefully, eventually for us. The first public draft will be out in July of 2022. It's really a forecast of our future activity and uh, really a, a forecast or a, um, a plan that tells us the projects that we need to um, deliver upon to meet our future demand. The one thing that we've added into this program is a very robust stakeholder engagement from um, all of our stakeholders, our, our communities, and uh, and we're very pleased at the way that is uh, that is moving forward. So much more to come on that. And again, I want to thank you for uh, your support of these uh, planning efforts to to, to support this uh, tremendous transportation asset we have here at MSP. I'm going to touch just a little bit on um, some reliever airport projects. We are getting close to finishing uh, some improvements out at Lake Elmo Airport, which has been a realignment of the primary runway. You can see uh, the grading on the runway, kind of in the middle of the picture on the right there, the, the old runway um, on the left side. Um, but that is a much needed improvement to support uh, the, the growth that we are seeing at Lake, Lake Elmo. It is not going to change the dynamic as far as the type of aircraft uh, that operate there. Uh, but it's going to improve safety uh, substantially uh, from what it uh, certainly has, adding new safety areas, a little bit longer runway, and uh, new lighting signage and, and other improvements. Uh, and then we're also entering into long-term planning efforts at uh, Flying Cloud Airport. Flying Cloud is our, our busiest uh, reliever airport, continues to, to uh, gain in, uh, in operate landings and takeoffs. And so uh, we're just starting that process now to really, uh, again, determine future activity forecasts and what the infrastructure needs are to um, continue to ensure that uh, that airport can serve, um, uh, serve the, the traveling public and uh, meet future demand. Again, like the MSP comp plan, it's going to be a robust stakeholder engagement program. And again, you will, you will eventually see this uh, down the road. And then I think I think this is the last slide, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I really uh, wanted to let the council know that we are focused on sustainability. Uh, we've got a really strong foundation with a sustainability plan that includes a 80% reduction in total emissions <clears throat> from 2014 to 2015, from 2014 and 15 baselines. 75% diversion reduction uh, when you look at reuse and recycling and compost, a 15% uh, reduction in water usage, and uh, really an employee sustainable, sustainability score of 80-85. And those uh, are our 2030 goals, may be adjusted as, as we go. Um, we are also working, uh, obviously, closely with our airlines, uh, especially Delta and Sun Country, to, to ensure that they are doing everything and that you know, when they, uh, what they are doing, we can help meet the infrastructure needs for those sustainability efforts. So there'll be a lot going on there. You, you may have heard there's a lot going on with um, sustainable aviation fuels as well. Uh, Delta has been very engaged. And I think, I think that uh, uh, the manufacture of sustainable aviation fuels cer certainly is an opportunity for the state of Minnesota to get more involved in. California is kind of leading the way right now with that, but I think a great opportunity for the state if, and, and I know the governor is very engaged in that as well. So uh, with that, I think uh, that is the extent of my presentation. I hope I didn't take uh, too much time, uh, but if you have any questions, I'd, I'd be happy to respond to them. Thank you, Brian. And you 
covered a lot of information. And uh, by the way, as an observer, as we all are, uh, the work you're doing in the uh, customer area, baggage claim, it really looks great. And, uh, we have hats off to you. I know we have time for just a few questions, if you're able to. And I see Councilmember Chambliss with your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Zali, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ricks. I uh, appreciate your presentation, and um, this is the second update that I've had from you, and um, uh, it's nice to see how, as a person that's from the Twin Cities, the airport has improved uh, over the years and expanded, um, and now I get to see um, a, you know, a top-level administrative view of that. I do have a question, um, as you are aware of the news about the 5G C band um, issue that's been coming up in the media. Uh, can you speak to um, your take on the impact and um, whether or not there is true interference and the timeline that you think is needed um, to address any potential concerns? Uh, thank you, Councillor Shambliss. Uh, yeah, obviously uh, <laughs> a situation that we've been paying very, very close attention to, as have our uh, airline airline partners. Uh, the good news is last week uh, when I was on a call with Delta, and at that time all of their all of their mainline aircraft, their larger aircraft, you know, narrow body to wide body aircraft. Uh, we're in good shape uh, because of the changes that have been made. The the FAA came up with a alternative, um, some alternative methods of compliance that the airlines were able to go through to fulfill to be able to meet those uh, requirements. And also by the end of last week, um, their connection aircraft, the regional aircraft, were all going to be okay as well. So we are in a much better place than we were, uh, we thought we would be a few weeks ago. And, and so that, that issue has really toned down. Uh, I, I will say it, it's unfortunate it, it happened the way it, the way it did. Um, uh, but I think ultimately, um, you know, the right things were done to ensure that it, it did not have an adverse effect on air traffic. There were some foreign carriers that were forced to I know Emirates was forced to shut down operations for a day coming into um, uh, the U.S., but it really has not been as severe of an impact, I think, as it, it could have been. What we actually had to do is um, we had to, uh, we call them NOTAMs, they're notices to airmen. We had to cancel our um, Category 2 and 3 approaches into the airport for a few days. Now, those approaches, the good news is those approaches are only used in really poor weather conditions, you know, really poor visibility conditions. We were, we were able to, after, you know, last week, we were able to pull those back off. So we are not uh, expecting any impacts moving forward. News. Awesome. Any other questions? Let's see. I'll make sure I see everybody. Well, not seeing any. Thank you uh, again, Brian. And I know we all appreciate this update and, we're, and our relationship with the MAC. We want to be um, supportive. We know there's uh, continuing efforts we can do together and uh, both as a land planner and as a transit provider. Um, we appreciate your engagement on some of our work. And uh, having said that, I hope we uh, next time we meet, it's in person. So we'll hopefully get you the wave. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Zelli. I, I agree. I hope that's the case as well. And thank you for the opportunity today. Have a wonderful yeah. meeting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Well, this brings us to um, the next item, which is the consent agenda. And uh, is there a motion to, and a second, to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Lindstrom. Thank you, Councilmember. Second. Coming seconds. Thank you, Molly. Any discussion? All right, Liz, please call the roll. Councilmember Barber? Aye. Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. 
Gonzalez? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lee? Aye. Lilligren? Aye. Lindstrom? Aye. Mousse? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. And Chair Zelli? Aye. The consent agenda uh, is approved. That motion carries. Which brings us to uh, reports of the standing committees. And first up is community development. Council Member Lilligren. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members. Uh, community development brings two items forward for approval. They're related items. The first is business item 2021-351, and it's to award $9.3 million in livable communities demonstration account development grant funds to support eight development projects in six cities. These development grants are for development or redevelopment projects that support livable communities and thrive goals of increasing access to housing, jobs, services, and transit in an effort to support a more equitable region. A total of 15 applications were submitted to the LCDA development program. 11 of those applications advanced to re be reviewed by the Livable Communities Advisory Committee and eight are being recommended for funding. In keeping with council guidance, no more than 40% of available funds may be awarded to projects located in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and then the remaining 60% of the funds are to be awarded in suburban cities. The projects recommended for funding will bring deeply affordable housing units online, create livable wage jobs, and increase connections to services and amenities across the region. Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council award eight livable communities demonstration account grants as shown in table one of the staff report, totaling $9,304,250 and authorize the community development director to execute the grant agreements on behalf of the council. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second by Barber. Thank you, council member. Any discussion, questions? All right, Liz, you may call the roll. Council Member Barber? Aye. Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lee? Aye. Lilligren? Aye. Lindstrom? Aye. Mousse? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Bento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. And Chair Zelli? Aye. That motion carried. Councilmember Lilligren. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members. The next is business item 2022-16, and it's to award $4.4 million in Livable Communities Demonstration Account Transit-Oriented Development Grant Funds, or LCDA TOD, and to four projects in three cities. The LCDA TOD development grants are for developments or redevelopment projects that advance both livable communities and thrive goals of increasing, increasing access to housing, jobs, services, and transit in an effort to support more and more equitable region. That LCDA TOD grants also advance the council's transit-oriented development policy, which is to promote moderate to high density development projects located within walking distance of a major transit stop. A total of 10 applications were submitted to the LCDA TOD development program Seven of those applications were advanced to be reviewed by the Livable Communities Advisory Committee, and four are being recommended for funding. In keeping with council guidance, the maximum combined award per city is $2 million. The projects recommended for funding will bring affordable housing units, livable wage jobs, and increased transit use to the region. Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council award four Livable Communities Demonstration Account transit-oriented development grants totaling $4,435,600 as shown in table one of the staff report and authorize our community development division director to execute the grant agreements on the council's behalf. Thank you. 
Is there a second? Second by Lee. Thank you, council member. Any discussion? I have to say this is really exciting, wonderful grants, wonderful projects. Uh, often not fully appreciated, the Met Council actually offers these kind of uh, opportunities. Any discussion, questions? All right, hearing none, uh, Liz, please call the roll. Council Member Barber? Aye. Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lee? Aye. Lilligren? Aye. Lindstrom? Aye. Musse? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Ento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. And Chair Zelli? Aye. That motion carried. Uh, the Environment Committee has reports on the consent agenda, and uh, there are no reports from the Management Committee, which brings us uh, to the Transportation Committee. Council Member Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Business item number 2021-329 is regarding the Gold Line Capital Grant Agreement for 2022 through 2026 from Ramsey and Washington County's Joint Powers Board. The Gold Line is a planned 10-mile tra transitway that will run generally along the north side of Interstate 94, primarily in an exclusive lane for buses within Ramsey and Washington counties. This agreement would allow Met Council to receive funds from the Joint Powers Board from 2022 through the project's start of revenue service in 2025. The proposed capital grant agreement will allow the council to continue pursuing project activities, including issuance of a civil construction contract for the project. Therefore, Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute Metro Gold Line Bus Rapid Transit Capital Grant Agreement number 21I042 with the Gold Line Joint Powers Board in the total amount not to exceed $148,840,529 for calendar years 2022 through 2026. Thank you, Councilmember. Is there a second? Second by Lee. Thank you, Councilmember Lee. Any discussion, questions? All right, hearing none, Liz, please call the roll. Councilmember Barber? Aye. Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lee? Aye. Lilligren? Aye. Lindstrom? Aye. Musse? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Vento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. And Chair Zelli? Aye. That motion carried. Councilmember Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Business item number 2022-22, same week, is regarding the TPP administrative modification. An administrative modification is a minor revision to a long-range transportation plan that does not change the list of funded projects or make major changes to funded projects in the TPP. Through processes carried out in 2021, local government agencies were given opportunities to propose updates to three TPP modal networks based on recent updates to local plans. These networks include the Regional Bicycle Transportation Network, the Regional Bicycle Barriers, and the Regional Truck Freight Corridors. All three networks are used as one of the criteria for distributing federal transportation funds to the regional solicitation. The purpose of this administrative modification is to incorporate these recent network updates into the 2040 TPP, which were previously approved by the Transportation Advisory Board for the 2022 Regional Solicitation. Therefore, Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council approve administrative modification number one to the 2040 Transportation Policy Plan to incorporate the Regional Bicycle Transportation Network, Regional Bike Barriers, and Regional Truck Freight Corridors Network as revised through the 2020 
one update process and accept the associated public comment report. Thank you. Is there a second? And this will second. Thank you. Any discussion, questions? All right, hearing none. Liz, please call the roll. Council Member Barber? Aye. Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Lee? Aye. Lilligren? Aye. Lindstrom? Aye. Musse? Aye. Sterner? Sterner? Bento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. And Chair Zelli? Aye. That motion carried. Thanks, everyone. Um, which brings us to our final item and other business. Business item 2022-35, Metro uh, Green Line Extension Settlement. We're going to have a motion second and then a presentation. But to start, uh, Council Member Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, Council Members, I would like to introduce business item 2022-35, Metro Green Line Extension Settlement. This item before the council will authorize staff to proceed with a settlement agreement with London McCrossin Joint Venture, the civil construction contractor. The agreement establishes new civil construction milestones, creates a dis dispute res resolution process, and expends project contingency. This action before the council will lay the foundation for us to establish a revised project schedule and opening date. We know this news has been long awaited by project partners. While there are other contract contracts to be negotiated, we now have a pathway forward regarding the civil. Our goal is to identify a revised timeline that delivers this project for the region and meets the needs of our communities, neighbors, businesses, and taxpayers. Therefore, Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute a settlement agreement with the London Macross and Joint Venture, make payments in the amount not to exceed $40 million within 60 days of execution, Resolve disputed matters through negotiations or an evaluative mediation process in amount not to exceed $210 million, inclusive of the $40 million payments in item number two, and make future payments as defined in the agreement. Lovely. Thank you. Is there a second? Fred, I'll second. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I think at this point, uh, we want to hear from uh, both the project team, uh, Jim Alexander, but to uh, start it off is Nick Thompson, our Deputy General Manager and Head of Capital Projects. Nick? Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members uh, for this opportunity tonight to talk about the business item, which is a major milestone in the project. Before we get uh, to the action, we thought we would give you some background on um, you, that we've provided before, but I want to make sure everybody had the right context for uh, why we're getting to the settlement and then talk about how uh, the structure of how we got to the settlement. And then I wanted to put it in context of the overall project. This is one element of us completing this project and getting it open and getting the benefits of the Green Line extension for the public. So first, I will turn it over to the project director, Jim Alexander, uh, to give some background on the project before I talk about the uh, settlement agreement process. Next slide, please. All right, thank you, Nick. So um, why don't we advance to the next slide there? Yeah, you can keep on going, Greg. Okay, here we go. So you've seen this slide in the past. This is the project scope and uh, a lot to tackle here. 16 new stations and uh, 44 structures at uh, Currently about uh, 60 per, a little more than 60% on the civil construction. Um, and got a lot of things, a lot of components in here. Next slide, please. So just wanted to stress that, uh, you know, this has a big impact, not just within 
our immediate metro region, but uh, statewide, 75% of uh, counties in Minnesota have someone taking a, a paycheck home. That's really important here. One point, almost, almost 2 million hours worked on this project. Uh, um, we are, you know, we closely focus on the DBE participation and uh, the, the current uh, status, I think as of uh, probably November of last year, the last tracking we have is uh, about 21% of DBE under the Linda Cross and uh, uh, contract. So that's going very well. We've been reporting that to you on a quarterly basis and it continues to be very strong. And the project uh, overall is gonna support 7,500 construction related jobs. Uh, uh, money to uh, nearly 350 million in payroll. Uh, big investment for the communities. Next slide, Greg. So we have a number of stations underway. Uh, got the opportunity to take some of you on tours to see some of those stations. And you see some of the images here. Uh, things are really coming together, and uh, and these are you know really uh, looking to improve the connections uh, for our regional destinations for the ground rounds and. Minneapolis, uh, the hospital, and the hospital near just south of Louisiana Station, uh, down ho downtown Hopkins area, United Health uh, Group, Optum's uh, corporate campus, uh, where we have the City West Station just in the north uh, east part of Eden Prairie, and uh, also access to Eden Prairie Mall. Next slide, please. So I think we may have shown some semblance of this before, but uh, you know we're pretty close to being done with utilities. Just a few more to wrap up, but uh, site prep and mostly done. The the big the big piece is just really the Kenilworth Tunnel and the, for the LRT uh, that runs through uh, Minneapolis here. And uh, as I indicated, we're about 60 62 percent done on uh, civil construction, and things are kind of quieted down for the winter winter months while we're. Uh, uh, going a little hibernation because of the cold weather, but uh, things will kick up uh, pretty strongly again this spring. And systems contract uh, just got, got underway last fall, and they're about 2% complete in the field. There's a lot of work behind the scenes on that contract uh, since we've had the Aldrich Parsons uh, up and running on that contract. And then there's uh, leading up to testing, uh, we need to make sure that the uh, system is safe and uh, make sure our operators are, are well trained before we get into revenue service, but that'd be the last piece to uh, get us to revenue service. Next slide, please. So we've talked about these issues in the past and uh, these are really the, the key pieces that are driving us to why we need to go through this uh, settlement agreement uh, process with uh, the civil contractor. And the first is this quarter protection. And we've talked in the past that this is a requirement per our agreement with BNSF. And uh, this was known going into the into the bidding process, but we were still going through the environmental clearance uh, uh, process as we were doing that as well. And so we kind of went in here, went in this eyes wide open, but uh, unfortunately the costs were, uh, were, were much more than was originally anticipated for this piece. And uh, we now have change orders in place. That work is uh, well underway. All the uh, drill shaft foundations are in and the wall, as you can see the image in the lower left is uh, getting in place. And, but this added uh, a lot of uh, uh, additional time to the, uh, the time impacts of the contractors that are looking to uh, complete the uh, civil work. Next slide, please. Next component, and this is probably the primary driver of uh, why we need to get to a settlement agreement with uh, LMJV. Uh, it really revolves around the unforeseen conditions. And, you know, I've been getting a lot of questions, you know, why didn't you know this? Uh, you know, anytime you're getting into the ground, you're, you're going you're gonna to have, you're going to have unknowns that are, that are coming in. And I'll just tell you, we, we've had a lot of uh, very smart consulting engineers looking at this uh, during design and we came up with a tunnel approach that uh, everybody felt was sound and uh, but uh, just through the unforeseen conditions we are where we are now today and we're uh, we're uh, tackling those issues but one of those pieces we have to build a secant wall uh, next to the the, uh, the Cedar Isles condominium uh, uh, buildings to uh, just really out of an abundance of caution is we didn't want to uh, see any settlement uh, occurring next to those buildings uh, could have uh, potentially caused some damage to those structures. So we went the secant route and that's really the driver of, uh, of our schedule challenges as we're uh, talking to you today. Next slide, please. 
So here's some images. Uh, you can see uh, one little segment of the uh, tunnel off the left with the uh, Vasika tower in the in the foreground. You can't see it, but it's just off to the right of that image is the railroad that uh, the contractor has to uh, be uh, be a friendly neighbor to. So anytime a train comes through, uh, the contractor needs to pause work and uh, restart once the train has passed. And the image on the right is showing the uh, the secant pile installation. We have two drill rigs out there today, um, and doing the uh, the drilling. But you can kind of see those uh, that equipment is very close up to the uh, up to, up to the uh, the structures that uh, we've been calling Sika. Next slide, please. So the third element, we haven't been talking about this uh, too much, but this is another element that the contractor has cited of inserting into the project via change order that has caused impacts uh, to their ability to get the work done. This was added uh, round about the time that we were going through the bidding process. Uh, the city had received a CMAC grant and uh, it was determined by the project partners that this needed to be added into the project uh, so as we get into revenue service. So this was another change order that was uh, in place. So next slide, please. So as I indicated, uh, you know, it's not unusual to to discover the unexpected, particularly when you're digging uh, uh, into the ground. And like I say, we, we had a lot of uh, a lot of smart uh, consulting engineers uh, working with this to determine what was the best solution to get this uh, tunnel through the Kenilworth corridor. And uh, we also invited vendors that were, uh, were we ultimately used on this project to take a look to see if it was doable. And we all said, yes, we can get this done, but, uh, but uh, we have the unknowns to deal with and uh, we're addressing those as on a really daily basis and uh, we're gonna get this, uh, get this tunnel done. Next slide. So we've talked about uh, kind of stepping through the process. I think this goes back, uh, boy, probably about this time last year where we said that uh, our revenue date of 2023 really doesn't hold anymore in terms of uh, when we're going to get uh, get all this work done. So we have the original civil construction schedule and cost, and we are working and tonight be part of this, uh, the new civil construction agreement with along with change orders that have already been uh, taking place. That'll get us to a revised construction schedule and cost. Next slide, please. So if we take that uh, where we are today with that revised civil construction schedule and cost, we I've been kind of cautioning everybody to because everybody's wanting to know what the revenue service date is, but uh, we do Nick I think is going to talk about that a little bit, but we still we still need to get systems uh, schedule identified and that's that's in work right now. Uh, the civil is uh, pretty much identified in terms of what we're looking to do for the revised schedule. And that information has been relayed to the systems contractor, Alders Parsons, and they are currently working on a new schedule. And with that, anytime the schedule gets extended, there are gonna be costs like we're seeing with the civil construction. And so the systems contractor will be working on costs and we'll have to go through negotiation on that piece. But then the next step is to revise, we need to update our supporting contracts, our engineering consultants, our quality management consultant. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, behind the scenes uh, consultants that are working on this project for us. And uh, we need to get the, them updated once we get a, a better uh, refined date for revenue service. And also our testing program, we're, we're, I think I've spoken to you, a lot of you about, uh, we're looking to, to, uh, to uh, really try to refine our testing program so we can, uh, we can, we can uh, bring in revenue service as soon as possible. So that's another piece that's uh, going into that mix, but ultimately that gets us to a revised project opening day and cost. Next slide, Greg. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, either I'll hand it back to Nick or uh, stand for any questions. I will, uh, maybe we'll wait till questions at the end and then we can finish up the process here. Sure, go ahead, Nick. Sure. So I wanna go through now how we got to the uh, settlement agreement structure that uh, we'll be asking you to vote on tonight. So with, with what it, Jim has outlaid, clearly the schedule and the cost that the contractor originally agreed to, those impacts uh, made us have to rethink the whole agreement with the contract, civil contractor and the schedule. So uh, we went through a process to think through what are our options to go to get to a new schedule with this contractor. Um, and so based on input we received from our project partners, 
uh, our peers in the process. We talked with MnDOT, peers around the country looked at other instances where this occurred. We thought it was very important to hire an independent set of experts that could help us work between us and the contractor to have an independent look at what the schedule can be and what the costs would be and reach an agreement, help us reach an agreement with the co civil contractor on a settlement. So we hired Venable and uh, through an action that this board previously took in a competitive process. And they've been instrumental in bringing us to the point tonight where we're at, where we've got a uh, general agreement uh, that we can move forward on a settlement of this. Next slide. So the framework of the agreement that we, uh, we're we working towards here is that you'll be asked to execute or authorize the execution of this agreement has some key principles that really the independent uh, firm Venable has really helped get us to this point, which has been critical. Um, we have had disputes that we needed a process that we would, both sides would agree how we're gonna resolve those disputes um, so that we can resolve them quickly and keep the construction moving forward. We all have the goal of wanting to finish this project and start realizing the benefits of the project in a as timely manner in the right, uh, 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 with the right way in both sides wanted that. So we needed a way to have any disputes that remain resolved. And so the framework has that. We also needed a way to make sure that the costs that we would be settling on would be properly vetted in an independent way and that we could document and justify those uh, costs uh, that we settle on with the contractor. Um, and then we really wanted to constrain the schedule to one that we can meet um, and hold the account, uh, contractor accountable to. So the action will establish uh, a new construction schedule uh, that we will operate on once the change order is in place. We have been operating without a construction schedule for quite a while now. And so this is a very critical step to have a schedule that we can hold uh, that we can work towards and the contractor can be held held to uh, to deliver this project. We have, we've agreed that there are um, costs that have been occurred that were above the original contract. And so we have to agree to a, a payment schedule for how those costs will be uh, paid to the contractor for costs that they are owed. And most importantly, we wanted to find a framework and a structure that gets the project completed in a way that the work can, can progress. We uh, looked at our peers around the country. There's many instances where a project, major project similar to this has reached un unexpected issues. And the result was a litigation process that dragged the project out. We really wanted to avoid that uh, um, in, in a way, our contractor wanted to avoid that. We want to complete this project. And so this framework that we uh, will reach allows us to resolve all disputes in a way that progresses the project. Next slide, please. What's really important in the schedule is to think about, we are really changing how this project is gonna be completed from where, when we put the contract out and awarded the contract uh, in 2018 and started in 2019, we had a very different sequence of how the project would be constructed. Um, and we then what we, we're gonna finish that with. And it's those issues that we've encountered that Jim outlaid that have required us to change the sequencing. The sequencing will add time, um, it, but it really changes how the contractor has to build the project and which segments are gonna be completed. But our schedule basically agrees to that new sequencing in a way that um, is the most efficient way to finish the project and get the systems integrator in. So it, it allows us to turn over components of the civil construction in phases to the systems contractor, rather than finishing the entire project and then turn it over to the systems contractor. That step was very important for the systems contractor to understand their schedule, but also in a sense, a save some time between uh, for us to complete the project. Next slide, please. So, what the agreement we're talking about tonight is for the civil construction schedule. The schedule that we will be agreeing to adds 34 months to the civil construction contract. 
um, with the last phase of it being not a surprise, but the Kenworth LRT tunnel will be the last component of the project that will civil project that will be finished. Um, components east and west of the tunnel will be finished sooner, but we expect the major portion of the Kenilworth tunnel uh, to be done in June of 2025 and ready for the systems integrator. Next slide, please. So cost, um, so the council and the contractor will utilize this agreed upon dispute resolution process to resolve the cost in the following categories. Extended performance costs. So adding time to the project um, incurs extra cost to the contractor over what they bid. So we needed a way to uh, deal with and agree upon what those extended time costs would be for the contractor. They will have their staff on much of their staff on 34 months longer than they anticipated in their original bid. They'll have offices and other elements that we need to add extended cost to. Um, obviously, when you add uh, this time to a contract, labor costs will go up over that time over what they uh, originally bid in their contract. So we have to deal with costs related to that. We want to make sure that the subcontractors who are very important to this project are also dealt with properly within this agreement. So we will, the framework uh, deals with how the subcontractors will be paid for their costs, including any additional costs that they have for these changes. Important element of this is we've had uh, a lot of change orders on this project, which is very normal on the project. Uh, a project of this scope has change orders. Central corridor, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but we had over 1,700 change orders on that project. Uh, to complete it. And we have a lot of change orders on this project. Um, we want to close out those change orders that are still open um, as part of this agreement. And that really allows us to progress the schedule to not continue to be working through those change orders. So uh, the agreement has a structure for closing out change orders that are open uh, through December of 2021. So that's a very important element of this framework. Um, and then it deals with any of the productivity and work that has been performed to date, which is different than what the contractor bid and is different because of the unexpected events or the events that we have pointed out here tonight. Next slide, please. So the council action, next slide, uh, as was moved in the motion, well, is really about that first circle on this timeline of getting us to the completed project. We'll be adding 34 months to the project, but then we do also, we wanted to frame it in terms of what the overall, what we need to do to get this comp project completed. Um, we, had, we expect that we will be adding some time also related to revising the systems contract. And we also need to settle on what our testing schedule is and those other supporting contracts that Jim mentioned. Those two circles are still to be negotiated and uh, re dealt with yet but by settling on this agreement with the civil construction it allows us to then uh, revise the schedule and reach settlement on those other components of the project in order to get us get us to the revised project day so the action before you tonight for 210 million dollars will utilize most of the remaining uh, funds in the project we expect that our forecast has with this schedule and civil and what we anticipate with the other remaining work that this will push out the project to be complete and open to the public in 2027. So um, additional delay beyond the 34 months, but 2027 is our new target date we wanted you to be aware of with this first action. We also, as I mentioned, we will be depleting, uh, using up available funding within the project with this action. We anticipate we're still negotiating this, but we may need between 450 and 550 million additional dollars for this project to get to the completion of the project, to handle those other components of the project from systems integration um, to testing, to startup, uh, to those elements and our support contracts, including our consulting support for engineering. So those are the two bigger uh, elements of this project to get us to completion that we we're now on a path with this agreement to get us uh, finalized and finish this project. Next slide, please.
So when we went through this, knowing that these additional costs and time, we looked at other options. Um, this project has faced questions about its budget in the past. And with our local partners, we have looked at other um, cost cutting measures on the project and changes in scope a lot. Some of that was done before the project was let and under construction, for example, removing the operations and maintenance facility in Hopkins was an addition, was an example of where cost cutting, but we're now at a point where this project has progressed substantially, we're 60% of it. So there are not elements, we are not at all, but we are finishing the project that is under construction because it is the project that um, we've committed to building for the public with our partners. Um, so there isn't elements like that, but this step tonight gets us a long ways to getting the completion there. We will need, as I mentioned, additional funding for this project. We're working with our partners. You know, our funding partners on this project have been Hennepin County and Hennepin County Regional Rail. The federal government has been a key partner in this. The council has been an important part of this, of delivering this project. So we are working and have been working with our partners to identify the available funding solutions to to complete that extra need that we have for the project. But it's clear that what's important is to finish this project, finish the project we're committed because the benefits of this project, though they will be delayed uh, by this, this action, the benefits for our region, for our state are still there. We are building, this is part of our vision for the Twin Cities um, and stopping this project is not an option. Um, and stopping this project also would be more costly. You do not just walk away from a project that is mostly done or 60% completed um, without costs and without litigation and elements like that. So that's not a viable option. It's not even the right option. It's not at all the right option to consider. It's it's to finish this project and, and is what we the path that we're on. So next slide, please. So we in the region have been building building a lot of transitways. This is a project that will be our most co uh, um, costly project that we've built to date. Um, it's good to put in perspective of our costs compared to our peers and projects that we have done. Uh, prior, when we originally estimated our project at the $2 billion project budget when we started uh, prior to construction, that was about $152 million per mile. With the overall changes that we've talked about tonight to finish the project, we estimate that the per mile cost of this project will be between 180 and 190 million per mile. That compared to our peers in Seattle and East Coast LRT systems are still within or lower than a lot of the systems that are being built out there today. And it's also, you know, in context of what we've built in the system, this is not our first project in the re region. Between our BRT system and our LRT system and our commuter rail, we have delivered our projects uh, on time and under budget. This is the first time that we've had a project impact like this and it's due to the conditions that we've met this is the mo one of the most difficult routes to build a system like this, but it's also the right route uh, for what we're serving and the customers that will be able to use this and the development that'll occur around this and what is supported by the cities and the county and our federal partners in the region for the development of this project. Next slide, please. So the core elements of the motion that is before you um, was is to negotiate and execute that settlement agreement. The, uh, a very important step is there'll be that change order that establishes uh, the new schedule and dates uh, to extend the civil contract. We will have elements within the agreement uh, for payment not to exceed $40 million within 60 days. And that's for work that we both, us and the contractor agree, has already occurred for the project. Is it important uh, that payments are made for that work for, for this contractor? to continue their ability to work. It also structures and resolves dis, uh, dispute matters through negotiations. And if the negotiations aren't finalized, we have an evaluative mediation process that is agreed upon with schedules uh, between us and the contractor, not to exceed $210 million, which is inclusive of that $40 million payment within 60 days. This $210 million we're asking you to approve is, uh, we do have costs, this is within the costs of the current budget of the project. Um, so we're, we have the funding for this agreement as it's structured. 
Um, and next slide, I believe is last slide, is um, after this action tonight, um, there is uh, another step with this project as we have had with some previous actions. Uh, this is settlement agreement, if passed, will proceed to the executive change control board that is chaired by Chair Zelli with the county um, uh, this Friday for, to advance the final stages of the settlement process. Um, and also an action to, for a future meeting for that same change control board to review the final details of the agreement and sign off for use of the contingency, the 210 million in contingency that's available within the project. So with that, Mr. Chair and council members, we would stand for questions. Okay, that's a lot of information. And uh, I know that there'll probably wanna be a discussion of questions. Uh, council member Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one thing that would help me right now, I think, is could you, um, Nick, to kind of remind me of the process of how these projects come to us? So the point at which we take them over from the engineering and building perspective, kind of what ha what leads up to that? Sure, that's a great question. So projects like this and our other projects, uh, tonight you had gold line on the, on the um, agenda for approval and our board action with the county boards. Um, they start with a local process, uh, locally driven process led by, in this case for this project, Hennepin County, through an, an alternatives analysis that looks at different modes, different routes, identifies a need for a transit project in a general corridor. In this project, um, it had the advantage of having railroad right away that had been purchased by Hennepin County in 1984. Um, so some opportunities within this project that drove some of the alternatives, um, but eventually uh, a, a preferred alternative is pr uh, selected with support of the communities uh, and the local agencies and, uh, and then Met Council becomes the, takes over the project to uh, take it through the environmental process, engineering process, design process, and leads the construction process and eventually we will be the operator of the project. So it's start these projects, start locally, gain local support. Um, and then we, um, as a regional, both as an MPO, are at that table, of course, also. But we take a project that is locally supported and bring it to development and operations and opening. Right, thank you. Okay. Um, let's see, Council Member, uh, I'm sorry, I dropped my mic here. Uh, Council Member Fernando, go ahead. Uh, thank you. And I just have a, a quick question. And um, it's the, the the amount of money that we're paying, the $210 million. Um, the information that we've seen is that that was already built in within the budget of the project. Yeah, Mr. Chair and Council Members. So uh, the original project budget was $2.03 billion. Um, as we were developing, as these issues arose and we were um, beginning negotiations, um, we did identify that additional money was going to be needed um, and an action was taken to uh, bring by Hennepin County and by the council to bring an additional $200 million into the project. So that was completed last year, 2021. And so this funding that is being requested in this action is utilizing the existing uh, funding that's available in the existing project budget of $2.2 billion. Okay, so my question was, if, if we hadn't had this unexpected expense, what would have happened to that money that was already budgeted in into the project? Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member, that if that was local local money that was brought to the project. So if um, if we did not if we completed the project without expending all the funds, that generally goes back to the source. A couple of recent examples that we have where that has happened, on the orange line, which we completed or are nearing completion, but our opening we opened in December, um, we are returning some local funding to uh, Hennepin County and Dakota County on that project. Um, and the green line between the Central Corridor Green Line also has some federal, we're about to close out that project. We have some federal funding and local share available there. And so we're working with local partners in that case of how, if they want, well, how, how they want to deal with 
re remaining funds in the project budget. So um, it, we have great examples of that. And we always work with our funding partners to see uh, how they best want to deal with that, uh, that funding. Okay, thank you. Sorry, uh, Francisco, I called you Fernando, but uh, that was my, my brain. Uh, is there any other follow-up question? No. Uh, all right, Molly Cummings, Councilmember Cummings. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Nick, for this presentation. I have two questions. I know that uh, the more specific date and cost uh, is coming out new, but uh, this evening. But I'm wondering, in general, if there have been conversations with the stakeholders, the elected officials along the extension, and what the uh, sense and feeling is uh, about the um, time frame and the cost, even though specifics have not been uh, revealed, uh, what kind of support are you, are you getting from the five cities along the Green Line extension? And then Nick, if you can talk a little bit more about um, what would happen if shovels got put down, what would be the net effect of that? I know you've said that, that that's not going to happen and I'm fully committed to this and I've already seen in certainly in the city of Hopkins just incredible development that is a result of in the anticipation of the line but um, if it were to stop what exactly would that mean? Sure. Mr. Chair, Council Member Cummings, both great questions. We um, have been talking with our local partners for the past year know about that there was going to be project delays. You know this is the week we're, we're kind of finally getting the opportunity to tell them what we think that delay will be. I'm sure there's disappointment um, in this delay. We're disappointed that this is not gonna be on the schedule we wanted, but there is uh, unwavering support for this project. Uh, they see, uh, the cities see the work that is being done. They see the development that's around it. They have supported it uh, numerous times for the actions uh, because they saw the, they realized the benefits of this project. And though we're delaying the opening, uh, they clearly, the generations that are going to benefit from this, they still see that value in this. So I think there's both the disappointment and the delay, but continued strong support for the project. In terms of what would happen, um, we have examples of that in peer agencies. Uh, real recently out in Maryland, there was a project that stopped Part way through. Um, extensive amount of legal action was taken. They ended up having to re-bid the remainder of the work. Um, and I believe they settled on a settlement of four and a half billion dollars of additional costs for that project, from what I read in the reports. Uh, and years of extra delay and that to get that process. Um, we, if an action, if we didn't have this action, we would be opening much later than 2027. What day we'd be opening, we don't know, because fortunately, I think we found a be the best path to get this project completed that gets us done in the soonest time, if that helps. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Barber, did you have a question? Um, Nick partially answered my question. My question was, you know, how much time did we really, uh, and he might not have a firm answer because we didn't look at it this way, how much time did we actually save by proactively looking at resequencing the construction? Um, and so that's my first question. Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Barber, you know, I guess we don't know for sure, but I think we've saved years off the project and we have saved money relative to other options that past we would have went to try to finish this project. This is the most expeditious way in light of what we've encountered and we believe is the most prudent way financially to finish this project. My second question was, um, have we been um, communicating back and forth with FTA as we've been going through this process? Mr. Chair, Councilman, yes, FTA obviously both a key partner, uh, a key funding partner in this project, uh, key oversight. Um, we keep them very close uh, so that they are aware both in advance of this announcement today um, that what is coming, but they've very, they are in the weeds with us on this project as developing. So we are making sure they are not surprised that they understand this. They also 
bring the context of they see other projects around the country developing so they understand challenges like this um, and are supportive of the process that we are undergoing to complete this project because just like everybody here they want the project finished too because they they funded the project because they saw the great value in this project thank you council member johnson have a big hand up thank you mr chair i really appreciate um this thorough presentation and i know it's just hard news right it's hard news to take and yet i know that there's been a team working on this for a while to get it to the place that it needs to be so that we can make the best decision going forward. I just have two quick questions. One is um, just in case people are watching, how will this impact other projects like uh, the Blue Line extension or any of the other BRT lines uh, just because the money you know is dedicated to certain projects, but just in case people are wondering, will this do something to the other projects that other parts of the region care deeply about? And then my second question is, because we've had so much engagement, honestly, I think we're close to 20 years into thinking about uh, Southwest light rail um, and early stage planning. Uh, how will we continue to engage uh, not only those cities and communities along the line, but just all, all the communities and all the people in general that are going to probably be watching this with great interest now, knowing that you know it's being pushed out to 2027. And then, um, and, and just also what can be the process, you know, at least for the next year and maybe a few months for certain that this council can uh, just get regular updates too on, on how this is working since there's still uh, some moving parts um, to get it to where it needs to be. Um, so those are my two questions. Sure, I will, uh, Madam Chair or Mr. Chair and Council Member, I will take the second question first because as you mentioned, 20 years of communicating on this project, we've gotten pretty good at uh, knowing what methods work and who, who how to reach them. Um, and we have a, a very extensive plan in action that started a few days ago on how to communicate this news and how to work with our communities. We have been wanting to tell them this new schedule and this price because it's there are our partners. Um, so we will we are starting Today, very with this meeting and going forward, talking with them, we have a quarter management committee next week, which is all our partners on the corridor. That's an important element that we give them information, but also let them bring information to us about what they need to know as they're, they're the communicators also. It's not just the council, it's our partners and us that are, are the communicators. And we have uh, all our neighbors on the project that we have uh, develop the effective ways to reach them. So I'm very confident that we'll be able to reach and answer questions. We also, if, if you're listening today and there's just go through the project website and we can provide that information that we, we have great ways that you can ask any question you want and we can get back to you as an individual too. In terms of the impact on the larger project, you know, the, um, tonight you took action on Gold Line. That Gold Line is one that we have hope to break ground on uh, with our partners in Ramsey and Washington County uh, uh, this summer yet uh, to start this construction of the dedicated BRT in the East Metro. That project does not get impacted by this. We will be coming to this council uh, this early this summer for approval on the Blue Line's uh, new uh, community supported route. Uh, and that project, project is the next light rail project that people are counting on and compared to this and they clearly this does not that project is in full motion and this discussion tonight does not change our dedication to getting that project into the selection of a community supported corridor and then beginning the environmental and design process on that and so we have uh, this council has adopted in our region is adopted to a vision for transit in this building out of our transit network um, and we're committed to finding the funding to complete the project that we talked about tonight. But the other projects are on the same path as they have been. Not, they're not impacted this time by the, this action. Thank you, Nick and, and Mr. Chair. And, and my hope would be too that as we continue now to move forward, of course, any updates go to transportation and management, um, continuing to you know make the public aware. Because if you are for light rail, this is a hard thing. 
And if you are against light rail, this is a hard thing. So uh, the thing though is that, you know, we are committed to multimodal transportation throughout the region. Again, this was set in motion a long time ago. Um, to not do anything would be extremely costly. Um, so that's not a good option. So, um, you know, it's just a hard decision and yet, you know, we need to move forward. So I think the important thing for me is, you know, lessons learned along the way and how we can take information and uh, make even better decisions in the future. And I understand this, we had some very difficult, difficult parts of the line, the, the Kenilworth uh, corridor, the tunnel layer and some stuff out in Eden Prairie, I get that, but anything that we can take in and learn and bring it forward into what we do, whether it's the process or the actual work at hand or what we learn through this contract renegotiation process, I think it'll serve as well um, and just share that throughout the council as much as possible. Thank you for those thoughts. Uh, council member Chambliss has her hand up. Um, thank you. Um... Uh, Nick and Jim for the very detailed presentation. Um, it's good to uh, have it laid out very clearly and understanding the complexity and the scale of uh, this very important regional project. Um, my question is, um, or maybe it's a comment, um, do we plan to, um, in terms of the scale of this project, talk about the impacts of the Southwest light rail, uh, not just in the short term, but in the long term. We're making significant investments for the future. And, um, you know, there is so much change that is happening in terms of the level of investment towards this project. And we haven't really captured the potential investment uh, of our, uh, of this project. And I know in other similar projects, um, can you talk about the level of investment uh, like for with uh, the green line, the first phase uh, that happened after building the project? Um, you know, we, we're talking about the costs and we're talking about some of the pain points, but this is a very long term project that's going to impact residents and the region, um, you know, for decades. Mr. Chair, Council Member Chambliss, that's a great question. I can actually talk about the impacts of this project. Uh, we know of two, bill, two billion, with a B, billion dollars of investment that has been built or has been permitted that is directly tied to this uh, development of this project around the stations. This project itself, even though we're going to have some delay here, is a driver of development around it. The communities, the five cities have really worked to make, to leverage this public infrastructure investment with their community to dwell on it. So we are seeing extensive development around just on this line of $2 billion to date. Uh, and it's not slowing down. The developers uh, are continuing to uh, work. We know that we're hearing from the cities that they are still uh, developing projects that they haven't even been permitted yet that are tied directly to this project. Um, the Central Corridor, we, you know, every one of our transit ways that we have built and opened has, has seen development around it. Central Corridor, even today, it opened in 2014, still seeing development occurring, new development along that corridor. We have some, um, we report on that annually and we can provide some actual reports to that as a follow-up to this about the development we see on each line. Um, but we're also seeing, you know, land uses reorganized around that. We have, these lines are serving event centers, our stadiums are being built around these. Our schools, hospitals are developing around these. Uh, it is just these a tremendous amount of development, but um, particularly on this project, it's it's really seeing a lot of development around each station, and and there's just more to come. Great question and great point, uh, Molly. Do you have a question or comment? I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nick, I'm wondering if you can address uh, the conversations around ridership post-pandemic. Obviously, nobody anticipated this, and we certainly didn't anticipate uh, what has happened with workforce around the pandemic. And obviously, again, this is being built for generations. I mean, this is a 100-year project, and it will benefit my children, my grandchildren, their children, and, and that's great. But how do you... Uh, 
think that ridership and the pandemic, the return to downtown, the, the, the hybrid, so forth, how do you factor that into the project at this point in time? Mr. Chair, Council Member Cummings, that question we are getting a lot uh, for a lot of our investments. Um, as you say, stated, this is a you know a hundred year investment. And it's one piece of our network that we are in the middle of building. We we are seeing these tra all day transit services like the Green Line Extension, where it operates frequently, fast, reliably, safely all day, are the ones that are having the strongest ridership during the pandemic. So we have confidence investments like this because um, you know we're not back yet. Travel has changed, but this is not a line that's just serving downtown jobs. This is serving jobs all along the core, all day long, all weekend long, um, and markets that we we knew there was demand that we haven't been serving. Um, to get from Eden Prairie to downtown before, you had options in the peak period on express bus. But what if you um, wanted to go partway to St. Louis Park? You didn't have options. This creates those options. It creates it's connected to job centers, not just downtown, but all along the corridor that we know that people want to use transit to get to those jobs. Employers are, are, are waiting to bring back their work. They might come back in a different schedule, uh, not five days a week like pre-pandemic, pre but it's clear employees will be back in the office. Um, but that's not the only rider on this. Um, someday the twins will be uh, good again and, and get ridership. And, There'll be a lot of rides that come on this for Twins games. By the time this line opens for a Vikings game, half the people arrive at a Vikings game on one of our transit ways. We're confident. In. Those types of trips are ones that we can serve, and we expect those rides to come back once we get past this wave of the pandemic. Travel will be different, no doubt. Travel not just for transit. People are traveling different on roads. Um, you know, we're building a pretty good regional trail with this system too. And uh, we'll have a lot more bike riders, maybe. Uh, that's one thing that has increased during the pandemic. So we're providing those type of benefits also. So we, we're confident, particularly in the long term, that we're building a system for generations. Um, we're down now. Travel's different in the short term with the pandemic. But we're building this all-day reliable service that people want. We expect them to be strong, strong ridership to eventually return. Thank you. I, I should also mention, I suppose, as as the council is a forecaster of population, uh, we have another 500 to 700,000 more people moving to this Twin Cities in the next, by 2040, and uh, the system's being built for them too. You know, Nick, your thoughts uh, bringing in uh, some of our planning function, uh, it is quite important for us as a council to consider some of our key goals, climate, equity access, uh, housing affordability, um, and of course, the interconnection of this transit system is all really supported by this backbone project. So it uh, does, uh, we could go on and how to, how to measure those impacts. Any other questions, thoughts? All right, I think we're ready for a vote. Um, I would uh, invite uh, Liz to call the roll. Council Member Barber. Aye. Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Lee. Aye. Lilligren? Aye. Lindstrom? Aye. Musse? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Bento? Aye. Wolf? Aye. And Chair Zelli? Aye. This motion carried. Uh, again, next steps will be an ECCB meeting on uh, Friday, and we will certainly, as uh, Councilmember Johnson said, uh, reporting on this frequently. To set a schedule, we'll have a cadence of accountability that will be more transparent as now that we've got this really important step in place. Um, I uh, 
want to just report quickly because I know uh, we have just a few minutes um, on uh, some of the uh, budget actions and proposals that have just been made, even some as late as today. Um, and I don't know if Judge Shenton is here. I just will highlight one. The governor in his supplemental uh, budget uh, uh, proposal announced today a $200 million for the blue line, um, which is an extraordinary, uh, I think, uh, proposal and one that builds confidence toward these, these transit projects. And certainly the blue line is moving right along as Nick has, de has described. And I think that's a not just a vote of confidence, but actual resources. As we know, uh, local governments are being stretched uh, with these kind of really expensive projects. So, um, but I, rather than get a full legislative report, I just, Judd, if you want to just give us a headline overview of kind of what's happened in the past few days, because this is kind of happening as we, as we speak. Great, well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. It's uh, great to see everybody. Uh, there has been a lot of news uh, here this last uh, week and just in the last day here, obviously, with um, with the update that we've been uh, that we received here tonight. But um, as far as the world of transit, uh, Governor Walls has um, in his bonding recommendations recommended $60 million to continue the investment in arterial BRT transit in our region. Uh, that means great things for both the F line, the H line and the guy F H <laughs> the next three lines I'm so tired <laughs> so those next three lines F H and G lines are all moving forward so that is great news um, we are also uh, included in the governor's transportation supplemental package where we will have um, matching dollars for any type of uh, federal funds that are made available for the low or no emission um, vehicle investment, particularly for our bus system. So we're very excited about that. We well, were positioned uh, to have about $13 million, maybe a little bit more than that, of matching funds available. Uh, we're waiting for that federal guidance to come out. Uh, generally, we uh, pay about uh, uh, you know 20% of the uh, of the cost of those um, investments, where 80% comes from the federal government. And we're, we're hoping that with that uh, those new funds and that guidance that uh, we'll be able to um, aggressively pursue those dollars as well. And so uh, obviously there was the news today about the governor including the uh, funding for the Blue Line extension. Uh, just to give that some, um, um, some context is the largest uh, funding that we've ever received in one time for a uh, transit transitway project in 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 our region was seventy million dollars for the uh, central corridor green line project back in two thousand and eight. This two hundred million dollars today represents uh, ten percent of that project, which meets the statutory limit of that what the state can participate in at this point. And so that is a an extraordinary and monumental investment in transit uh, that the governor has put forward here. And so we're very appreciative of that and we recognize the challenges of of what we've heard today and also the excitement of what we're seeing related to the to the blue line extension and i'm sure we'll have a full-bodied conversation with the legislature about these matters as well and as uh, we had a, a conversation with the legislative commission of metropolitan government this morning and um, there's some additional news that came out tonight that i'll be sharing with them related to the updated budget and timeline. And so I'll be talking with them here yet tonight, but um, uh, with the session starting next Monday, we'll be kicking things off. And uh, one last thing that I would like to say, Mr. Chair, if you'll grant me this, is uh, Brooke Bordson from my staff is leaving and uh, taking a new job with the federal government. Uh, I want to recognize Brooke for everything that she is, which is an absolute star for us. And I wish her nothing but the best. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, uh, Hannah Palmeyer from the Communications Department, who has legislative experience, is going to be uh, helping me out while we um, find a permanent replacement for that position. So uh, I wish Beth, I wish Brooke the absolute best, and uh, and look forward to working with Hannah and all of you. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'm sure I'll be back soon to talk about the rest of our legislative uh, um, you know agenda this this uh, session, but. Uh, for right now, I, I know everybody is uh, ready to wrap things up, so I'll, I'll wrap them up as well. Thank you, Judd, and I appreciate those uh, those quick highlights. Uh, also, um, I will certainly echo on 
behalf of all of us, a uh, deep appreciation for Brooke's contribution to our, uh, our uh, oh, so many things that we do. And we know uh, how more than competent she's been uh, uh, really helpful to all of us and know how, how great Hannah is. So uh, we're in good hands, but, uh, you know, I, I wish Shirley Brooke well. And, and uh, we certainly hope her path, her path crosses with ours in, in the future. Um, say, speaking of transitions, uh, tonight, I believe, is Chris Ferguson's last council meeting. And I know this is not new news that uh, Councilmember Ferguson is uh, combining a household, which seems to be uh, much to our dismay outside of his district. So he is leaving the Met Council. Uh, but uh, Chris, I just to say again, on behalf of all of us, how incredibly uh, um, uh, uh, important your contributions have been to all of our work, and, and you're such a personable guy. It's been really great working with you, and I know that your leadership, particularly of the management committee, uh, we just heard it today, the relationship with the MAC, um, uh, you're bringing us a little bit of private sector sensibility, which is something I always appreciate, and uh, the fact that you have really advanced in the very tangible ways some of the equity conversations that I think are well on their way that you have helped set in motion. So your impact on the council uh, will be long lasting. Uh, please don't be a stranger and we know you won't, but um, really want to acknowledge your last uh, full meeting and uh, important one to, to attend it at that. <clears throat> Thank you, Charlie. And I think, you know, I, I shared at the management committee, I think really what, uh, you know, for, for me, you know, we, I, I maybe a little bit like you, you know, prior to getting into government, you sort of, uh, it's easy to sit on the outside and complain about the things that aren't getting done and, or, or uh, the challenges that exist and, and in business, you sort of, sometimes you, uh, you, you poke at that and, you know, being on the inside, what you realize is that, you know, it, it one is it's, it's incredibly tough to, uh, to significantly move things because any, any organization like the council, uh, you know, obviously a lot of political issues, but also legislative issues that prevent us from doing maybe everything we'd like to do. Um, but what's truly impressive is just the, the quality of the staff and the people that we have. You know, we, we really have a group of people that want to get things done, that want to find a way to make things happen. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the slow pace of, of government is not a result of necessarily the, the people, but, you know, having due process, right? Making sure that we're hearing from constituents across the region, making sure that we're following all the laws and, and following the legislation, in some cases needing to change the legislation be able, to be allowed to do things. Um, but really what, for me, what is, what, um, what I've enjoyed most is, one is getting to know, obviously the council members, the people in my district, uh, but really the staff, right? And understanding the people that, that make this organization work, that make the region work, uh, and, and really get all the hard work done that allow us to accomplish really anything that we're that we're trying to get done. And so um, I, I truly appreciate the time, appreciate the opportunity from the governor uh, to do this. And, and we won't be a stranger, but uh, we'll be engaging in, in different ways to uh, to help grow the region and and make it a more prosperous one. No, oh, thanks, Chris. And, uh, wonderful work. Thank you, Chris. We'll miss you. Any other reports from any council members wish to share? All right, uh, Mary, any word from the regional administrator? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And to council member Ferguson, I tried to chirp in at the management committee and my technology was not working. And so just a deep appreciation for, for all you've done with the management committee and with the council. You know, I still have my post-it note on my my monitor here and it will stay that says understand the value of making different choices and that came from you and that's the way you know i'm attacking the the strategic initiatives that the council gave us whether it be equity or transportation or housing um you know really looking at the different choices that we make and the value that we get from from looking at things a little bit differently so so thank you so very much for for all you've given me in in your time here um, secondly, I just want to um, um, let the council know that um, in our transit system, we were experiencing 
many, many drivers and, and operators out on COVID leave in the last couple of weeks um, to the tune of, of, I think, over 100 in, in one week. Um, those people are starting to return. And um, I will say that that West reported today that, that this has been a, a much, much better week as those, as those operators return and were able to put um, more consistent service on and not missing pullouts. And, and that's great news to hear. And just, um, again, kudos to Wes and team, Brian, um, for really managing through a really tough time that we were seeing with, with our absentees with um, the Omicron variant. So, so great work by, by that group as well. And with that, Chair, I, I'm done. Thank, thank you, Administrator Bokey. And if we are to believe the data coming from our wastewater system, and I do, uh, we may have already had that peak and we're on the downside of this Omicron, Omicron wave. Uh, Anne, any report from our General Counsel? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Um, on behalf of myself and the Office of General Counsel, we just really want to echo uh, your thoughts and thanks to Council Member Ferguson. Um, we really enjoyed working with him and being pushed by him, and um, we just all wish him the best of luck, and I have no further report. Okay, well, I can't believe it. Like a good train, we're a little ahead of schedule on time. Um, I just want to thank everybody and we to echo a lot of the words we just heard from Chris and others. Uh, we are blessed with a very creative and determined staff and a very creative and determined uh, and aware council members. So, um, you know, we're able to make hard decisions, but also embrace a vision for the future and stick with that. And, uh, you know, so hats off to everybody. Uh, I think this was a really important meeting. And we're certainly going to be meeting again soon to uh, address this and other issues going forward. So stay warm. Have a good evening. We'll see you very soon. And this meeting is adjourned. Good night.